Welcome to the HMO Property Podcast, where we connect, educate, and inspire the UK's HMO property community. So stop what you're doing, sit back, relax, and enjoy the story. What's up HMO Nation and welcome to another episode of the HMO Property Podcast with me, Rupert Wallace, in association with hmohub.co.uk. In this episode, we're interviewing successful HMO property investor, Chris Peel. Now, Chris is going to take us on his HMO property investment journey, including the ups, the downs, the highs and the lows. Now, Chris has been investing in HMOs for some four years now. He's completed over 29 HMO projects, currently housing 145 HMO tenants. So let's jump straight in. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks, mate. Really good to be here and uh, looking forward to talking to you and your audience. Great. Before we dive into the details, Chris, tell us a bit about yourself. Tell us about your background before you started your HMO journey. Cool. Okay. So um, before property in general and specifically HMOs, I was very much in the corporate world. Um, So I went kind of followed the classic what I thought was going to be a successful career route, which was university into a grad scheme uh, and then got headhunted by one of the big four, um, which was PwC, and then started trying to climb my way up the corporate ladder there. So uh, very much involved in management consulting, spending a lot of time away from home, Um, living a lifestyle that I thought was the route to being successful because you know know, everyone has their own perception of it and my my idea was that you climb the corporate ladder and when you get to the top that's when you've achieved success Um, but unfortunately I found that um, in the corporate world you're very much a bit of a it's a bit of a meat grinder Um, you get sent on projects for long periods of time which was you know fine but it's long hours if you even mention the word overtime it can be a a scary word for anyone involved. Um, So you're expected to put a lot more in than you're contracted for. So I was was spending a lot of time down in uh, Southampton working with a uh, a local city council in that neck of the woods. Um, And then I was spending a lot of time down in Weybridge working for a defense company, Um, all the time doing these cost cutting exercises that effectively meant making people redundant, um, which was pretty soul destroying at the best of times. and that's, and that's when I realized that I had to do something different. And that's when I started turning towards property as a way out of that world um, and started building a property business and then introduced HMOs as a part of that. Got it. So tell us, Chris, how did you actually get into HMO property investing? So HMO property investing was my second strategy that I implemented. And it was because I wanted to diversify my portfolio. I didn't want to be all my eggs in one basket. What was your first? Uh, Service accommodation. So I built a serviced accommodation business and then thought, well, I've got all my apartments in one sector in one town. I need to spread out a bit more. I don't want to be overly, overly reliant on something because, you know, service departments are great, but that's very much kind of uh, tourist and business travel. And if if a recession hits and you, well, I should say when a recession hits, you know, it's, it will at some point. Um, service departments I, I see as much more vulnerable than HMOs because you know HMOs there's always going to be demand for for rooms you know even if even if people need to downsize what are they going to downsize from you're going to get the people from a one bed flat going into a room you're going to get the people from two bed flats maybe downsizing into one bed flat so even if there is a recession and everyone downsizes be, being towards the bottom end of the price spectrum there's always going to be demand for rooms and that's why I love HMOs as a strategy because I see it as a bit more recession proof than anything else Okay, so just just tell us about that actual moment when you thought, I'm going to get into HMOs. How did you get to that point? Um, well, it was, a, it was a, yeah, it was a, it was a long time ago now. <laughs> it was, I was at an event and I was chatting to a guy that I got on really, really, really well. Um, and he had mentioned to me that um, he had a contact who knew some people who owned some property. Um, and that was in a town that I wasn't operating in. And he was talking about HMOs to me, which was something I hadn't really 
considered up to that point. Um, but when he mentioned that he had a contact who knew somebody who had a lot of property in, in Bedford, um, and would I be interested in joint venturing on it? That's when we kind of started having that conversation. Um, and we decided that we would at least go and you know, have initial discussions on pricing and see what the profitability looks like, start doing the assessment on the area to see if it's the right area for HMOs in the first place. Um, and from there, we kind of decided it was and took everything forward from there. But that, I suppose if, if I had to choose a moment, it would be that conversation at that networking event where we, he, he kind of suggested something to me. And I went, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Great. And was there anything holding you back before that uh, to get into HMO investing? Um, I wouldn't say it was necessarily holding me back from it, but there was something stopping me. And that was that I, I strongly believe that if you want to be successful in business, you need to focus. And so up until that point, I had focused on a niche, which was service departments in London. That's it. And if it wasn't service departments in London, I didn't want to know. But it wasn't until we grew that to about 15 properties that I started looking for something else because by that point I built my systems and I built my team in place. Um, so I was able to extract myself from the process to start looking at something else. But until that point, I suppose, not sure it necessarily held me back, but it certainly prevented me from doing it was that I was very much focused on building that business. Got it. Per perfectly reasonable, I think. <laughs> Everyone, everyone needs a bit of focus, and in the property industry, shiny penny syndrome is, uh, oh, is massive, all over the place. So massive, yeah. I admire anyone who can focus. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong; it didn't, it didn't always start off like that. So I think when I, I, I officially say I started in property in February 2016, um, but then I was doing, I was going to do deal sourcing, and I was going to do HMOs actually, and then I was going to do uh, developments, and then I was going to do flips, and then I was going to do some title splits, and I didn't do anything. And then service departments started, and that's when I said, right, I'm doing that, and I'm focused on that. And and until that was built, that was all I was going to do. And then I focused on HMOs, and that's all I focused on, and that was built. And now that's kind of all I do as well. Brilliant. Chris, tell us about your very first HMO property deal. So it's a bit of a saga, actually. There's, there's, there's a good story attached to this one. So it, <laughs> it, was, it was dramatic. Um so it was following on from this conversation I'd had with my JV partner, a great guy called Toby based in Bedford. Um, so we sat down with an agent who was this person, was Toby's contact, who knew somebody who had lots of properties that was open to the idea of us working with them on a rent to rent basis. And we were discussing this first property that they had. It's a six bed, uh, all nice, large bedrooms, kind of Victorian terrace property big high ceilings, beautiful interior, um, needed a bit of a reefer, not, nothing massive, just cosmetic. Um, but we said that, look, if we take on this property, give us, give us a, uh, a five year contract. We'll do the refurb at our expense. That'll be our input. Uh, it was already furnished. So that kind of helped with the costs a little bit. Um, needed a bit of extra bits and bobs doing like new wardrobes and stuff, but nothing massive. So, we thought it was a done deal. We thought everything was lined up. We had an agreed price. We had kind of everything ready to go. And on the morning of contract signing, I turned up at the agent um, ready to sign the contract and pay the money. And um, there was a bit of a, a bit of a delay. So I, you know, I signed the contract and then said, right, have you got a signed version from the landlord? Oh no, they've not signed it yet. I thought, okay, right. Do you know when they're going to sign it? Because because we thought it was such a done deal, we had everything lined up. So I literally had decorators stood on the porch waiting for me to come back with the key from the agent. Wow. Um, we, were, we, were, we thought we were done. Um, so we we waited and they said, oh, probably be a couple of hours while we try and get hold of them. So I called our decorators and said, look, guys, you're on the clock anyway. That's fine. Just go and get a cup of coffee. We're just waiting for the keys. You know, I'll, I'll give you a shout when we're ready. So off they went. They went and grabbed a coffee. And then... As the day went on, it became more and more apparent that the aid, the, the owner wasn't going to sign. And then eventually they said, look, I'll look at the contract after work. So that's going to be like half five. So there's a full day lost there. And the decorators were calling me every 20 minutes saying, look, we could be on other jobs. And I was like, look, I'll, I'll pay you day rate. Just, you know, stick around because I think we're going to get the keys at any point. Anyway, like half five came around and the uh, the landlord decided that they would talk about it in the morning so i then had to put set up an airbnb and have the decorators stay over 
So I called, like, found, huh. a, found a property on Airbnb, put the decorators in an Airbnb because they were my team from London. They'd come up for the night, okay. uh, sorry, for the day to just to do the project. Uh, so I put them in an Airbnb, idea being that they could crack on first thing in the morning. And then the, the morning came around and the basically the landlord had said, look, I'm not being pressured into signing anything. I'm pulling out of the deal. Um, forget it. So like this deal basically crumbled around us. Uh, it was like watching it in slow motion with nothing you could do because the agent was not willing to let us talk to the landlord and they wanted to be the point of contact. They didn't want us going around them. So there was literally nothing we could do about it. Um, so from that point, the deal was dead. Uh, but then a couple of, I think it was like a week later, um, Toby called me up and he was like, oh, I think I've, I think I've met somebody who's cousins with the, with the landlord. And he just happened to be chatting to someone who mentioned that there was a property for rent on this road. And it was the one we've been talking about. And we, uh, we got their contact details and we met the landlord, um, in a pub and basically said, look, if we can sit down and talk this out, like find out what your concerns are, let's have a, have a conversation uh, and see if there's anything we can do to salvage this because they wanted the deal done. They just didn't appreciate the agent pushing this contract at them. And it turned out that the agent hadn't given them foresight of the contract, hadn't really explained what we were going to be doing with the place. So when this rent to rent contract appeared in front of them saying we'll be subletting the place, they what what's this? Why this isn't a standard AST. So, um, yeah, a lot of lessons learned on that one. Um, I guess part of which is make sure that the agent knows how to pitch it to the landlord um, and they don't, you know, you, you, as long as you explain it to the agent, you can assume your job's done. But actually knowing them, knowing how to pitch the idea of, of, of rent to rent to the a, sorry to the landlord as well is almost just as important as the agent getting it from your perspective. Absolutely. Blimey, what a saga. Oh, it was it was a stressful week. <laughs> it was a stressful week. But you got it over the line. Yeah, Give we us got some it over of the, the headline line. numbers, Chris. Uh, cool. So it was it's a six bedroom place. Uh, we had two rooms that we rented out for five hundred and four rooms at five fifty. Uh, so thirty two hundred rent roll. Um, then we paid them eighteen hundred pounds of rent and about five hundred pounds of bills. So we were making about nine hundred pounds of profit um, from a six thousand pound investment. So nine hundred a month, six thousand in, nine hundred a month out. Sounds like a good deal. Yeah, it was pretty good. Um, so it broke even within, I think, within six months. Or just No, just over six months, seven months broke even. Um, but the best thing about that one is not necessarily the figures from that deal, but it's what it led on to because that landlord, as we said, was kind of a bigger landlord and they had a few properties. So we got number 37 in the street, which is kind of in the middle. Then we got number 39, which is next door. Then we got number 35, which is next door. Then we got number 20, which is just a bit further down all from that initial connection. Um, and it's one of the things I love about property in general is, is you never know who you're talking to. You never kind of know what the potential is. And there's so much serendipity involved in just kind of being in the right environment. Brilliant. Chris, next question. How has investing in HMOs changed your life? Um, beyond recognition. Um, you know, if I compare my life in property and running a property business to my life in the corporate world when I was working 70 or 80 hours a week um, away from home a lot of the time, it's, it's, it's incomparable. Um, the number of people I've got to work with, I've got some awesome business partners. So we have five HMO businesses that we've set up and one of them I've sold, one of them, two of them I've merged and now we have three with uh, five partners that are just awesome people to work with. They, you know, really driven and want to grow the business and that's the kind of people I like surrounding myself with is people who want to go on this journey of growth with me uh, and build something really spectacular. Pearl, love it. Chris, what's your favorite part of HMO property investing? Oh, good question. Um, so I, I think the bit I really like is the upfront bit, the sourcing and the finding out like laying out the property and maximizing its income. So looking at whether we can add rooms, looking at whether we can add amenities that are going to boost the values, um, dealing with the agents and dealing with the landlords because we focus primarily on rent to rent. I say that I'm actually going to sign a contract today for a, for a purchase, but primarily we focus on rent to rent. Um, 
So a lot of the work is kind of working with agents, uh, negotiating on rental terms with landlords. And I really enjoy that side of things. Um, it's probably my favorite thing about it because I feel like it's it drives the growth of the business. So whereas the management is super important, and obviously if you don't have the management correct, you're not going to have a profitable business. I really like the the front end stuff, the growth stuff, um, and that's where I spend most of my time and energy is on raising finance and finding deals. Brill. Chris, we talked about your past, but before we move on to the present and your future plans in HMO property, let's take a minute to thank our sponsors. Are you looking for an effortless HMO mortgage experience? If that's a yes, there's only one place to go, www.thehmomortgagebroker.co.uk, the UK's number one specialist HMO mortgage broker. They're so specialised that they don't do anything else. HMO mortgages, HMO remortgages and HMO bridging. That's it. They have access to every HMO lender out there and even some exclusive products not available to other brokers. With lightning fast service and A1 communication, they're easily the best HMO broker in town. So to experience HMO lending made easy, go to www.thehmomortgagebroker.co.uk today. Chris, fast forwarding to the present day, go into a bit more detail for us about your current HMO portfolio. Okay, so um, right now we have 29 HMOs. Um, we've got them spread across. So we have four in Birmingham, five in Coventry, um, 17 in Bedford, three in Luton. And we just sold four that were in Kent. So we did have 33, but we actually sold that portfolio onto somebody else because it was too far for us to manage. Um, so we've got rid of that one. Um, they're a mix primarily of five beds, I'd say. You know, we do have six beds. We do have a couple of eight beds. Um, and I guess what, what, what would you like to know about it really? Uh, no, I think that's, that's a good overview. We, we got some headline figures from you. You got 145 tenants. Are they yeah. professional HMOs? Are they students? Are they a mix? Are they all self-contained? Are they just rooms? So it's a bit of a mix. I'd say our tenant demographic is all working professionals. So that doesn't necessarily mean white collar. You know, we have a mix of white and blue collar, um, we don't really tend to deal with DSS, although we do have two DSS tenants at the moment in one of our properties. Um, we Again, we tend not to try and mix things. So we do have some students in some of our properties, but they're always postgrads rather than undergrads. Uh, just because we find that if you try and mix a student house with a professional house, it just doesn't work. And it can kind of be the same with DSS tenants as well. Um, that we found that if you try and mix a DSS house with a working professional house, uh, you get some clashes um, because people are in very different places in life. Uh, they can have different priorities and therefore some of the things that can happen in the house makes it hard on the management. And you can spend a lot of time you know, resolving tenant conflict rather than finding that next property deal. Um, so we try and try and keep our houses as single demographic as possible. Now, one of the moves we're trying to do at the moment is actually move our HMO business more towards um, a B2B approach where instead of finding a property and then trying to find some tenants for it, we're actually going out working with companies to say, right, what are your accommodation requirements coming up and then providing a house for that. So we're trying to flip the model on its head effectively and say, well, well okay, so hello, hello, Mr. Client, you know what you've got people coming to the UK from abroad to fill these positions. Um, you're responsible for their accommodation for the first six months. So do you want, you know, can we provide that room, that accommodation for you? And then that f for us, that means that it's completely risk free because we know that when we're sourcing a property, it's 100 percent occupied from day one. And that's how I think you saw my post on Facebook the other day, didn't you, about my big deal in Bedford where we've just taken 15, a 15 room place where it's actually five, three, five bedroom flats, one on top of the other. And we're converting it into an 18 bedroom HMO. And we know that from mid January, that's completely full. All 18 rooms are filled and that'll make 4,000 profit per month um, because we reverse engineered this. We kind of went to our client first and said, right, what are your accommodation requirements? And we need to find 40 rooms for them. So there's 18 of them straight away. And we know that they're, they're filled from day one, which is really the way that we want to take it from, from now on going forward. We will continue along the traditional model as well. 
but I, I would like to build this B2B side of the business as well. Brilliant. Well, this leads nicely on to the next question then, Chris. Tell us about your single best HMO investment to date. <laughs> hmm, which one should I choose? <laughs> well, tell, let's go into that deal a little bit more. So is that yeah. a rent-to-rent -rent deal? Is that a purchase deal? Yeah, so it's it's a rent-to-rent -rent deal. Um, it kind of accidentally fell into being this B2B approach because we were, it's one that we've been working on for quite a while. So we turned up in bedford for a viewing a four bed house and the agent just completely forgot to show up and i'd driven down to bedford from leamington which is where i live these days um which is about an hour and a half's drive and they forgot to show up and they wouldn't come because they had a full diary so i called up their director and had a bit of a go i was like look you completely wasted i've driven down specifically for this viewing um have you got anything else you can show us in the meantime and she's like oh, actually i've got this thing that's not on the market do you want to come and have a look at this? It's a bit of a wreck, needs a bit of work, but um, come and come and see what you think. Um, so we're like, yeah, fine, all right. It's good, good use of our time while we're here. So we went along and we didn't really know what we were going to be looking at. And it was this, yeah, it was this th block of three flats stacked one on top of the other. It's like, it's on the high street. So it's one of these buildings that's like a tall townhouse. So you've got a shop on the bottom floor and then you've got three flats above it. Um, and it had been used for, I think it was refugee housing previously. So the condition was a bit wrecked. Inside it was in a bit of a state um, because they hadn't really been taking care of the place. And we went in and we were looking at it thinking, well, look, we're going to need to spend some money on this. We'll need to make a bit of a cheeky offer because there needs to be a lot spent on this. So we, managed, we offered £3,000 um, per month for the three flats, knowing that we could turn them into six bedrooms. Uh, we calculated we need to spend about £30,000 on the place to get it up to a good standard and fully furnished and, and ready to go. Um, and our £3,000 offer was initially accepted, then rejected, then came back on the table, then rejected again. And then again, we had to have this moment where we we're like, right, let's just all sit around the table and have a conversation because it's going back and forth on email. We need to just get face to face on this. So we sat down, we agreed a price, which was £3,100. Um, and we managed to get the deal over the line kind of with myself and my business partner, Toby, and um, our, the agent that we work with and the owner kind of all sat around the table together. Um, and at that point, we'd also been working on this B2B side, not really with the intention of going, well, look, if we get in with them, we can fill these 18 rooms. But that's just kind of how it happened to play out. Um, so initially we were thinking we'd probably put it on the open market and follow the traditional route and just advertise those rooms make them really really high spec so that we can get a premium and that they they fill really easily because it's a great location it's a nice nice building by the time we finish the refurb it's going to look amazing um but we hadn't really we'd, we'd planned a ramp up of room occupancy so we'd we'd planned to probably not really have much in the first month then probably get it 70 percent filled in the second month and then have it completely filled by the end of the third month um but it just it, it, the timing worked out really, really well that this uh, B2B deal that we were working on kind of dropped in our lap at the same time as getting these 18 rooms. Nothing lucky about that. <laughs> yeah, I suppose, yeah. Hard work meets opportunity. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> Great deal. Thanks for yeah. sharing that one, Chris. That's really cool. good deal. Next up, Chris, tell us about one significant mistake that you've made in your HMO business that by sharing with the audience, you might help them avoid? I'd probably actually go back to my first deal again um, and say that, you know, if you, it's all very well, you assuming that the agent gets what you're doing if you're working on a rent to rent basis, but do they know how to present that idea to the landlord so that they get it? Because that could have been a very expensive deal, a uh, very expensive mistake for us because we, you know, we'd paid, we'd paid agent fees, we'd paid, although I, assume we would have got those back i suppose but we'd got decorators lined up we'd got furniture orders placed things things were ready to go and i think in hindsight having all of that stacked up and ready to go without a contract signed it was a mistake i was trying to be really really efficient and so that i get keys decorators go in we're ready to go by next week um but i think in hindsight i would probably allow a bit of time um, always assume that there's going to be an overrun because they're 99% of the time there is. Uh, things never kind of play out of the timings that you expect. 
And I've fallen into that trap a couple of times during the journey of assuming that, right, the decorator says it's going to be five days, so I'll assume it's going to be six, give them an extra day, and then all of a sudden it's ten days. And we've got furniture trying to arrive at the same time as paint being still put on the walls and door frames, and it's like, that's a bit of a nightmare. Um, so, yeah, I'd say two things. One, allow for extra time in everything that you do in property because it always takes longer than you think it will. And B, um, make sure that if you are doing a rent-to-rent -rent strategy, just make sure that the agent knows how to present that to the owner, not just that they get what you're trying to do. Got it. Couple of good learnings there, and I'm sure that's something HMO Nation will appreciate. Chris, tell us about your HMO portfolio plans for the next 12 months. Cool. So I've actually got um, a meeting tomorrow with my Coventry and Birmingham business partners, uh, but I have already had our planning session. So every year we sit down with my partners and we go, right, what do we want to achieve next year? Um, so we've we've sat down and we've we've decided there's there's three core products in our portfolio at the moment. There's our contractor housing, which is our service accommodation. There's our B2B side of the HMOs. And there is the open market HMOs. So where we just take on the property and find somebody to live in it. So those are kind of our, our three niches that we operate in. Um, and that's really going to be the focus for 2020 is ramping up each of those. Now at the moment, service departments or this contractor housing model isn't done in any of my, isn't done outside London. I only do that in my business in London. So I'd like to roll that out to each of the areas that we're going to be working. Uh, we'll be very much looking to leverage our relationships in the B2B world as well. So if we can over deliver on this contract, we'll be looking to leverage that out because it's a big national employer. We'll be looking to kind of use contacts from within that industry to um, bring that model to the different towns that we operate. So we've set goals for next year um, of an additional eight properties in Luton, um, an additional 10 properties in Bedford, and I haven't set our goals for Birmingham Coventry yet because that meeting is tomorrow, but I imagine it will be something very similar. So we did nine in the first year, so I imagine we'll be looking at around nine or ten uh, within Coventry and Birmingham, maybe even here in Leamington as well, um, because we've got some great demand here in Leamington right now. Uh, we're getting a lot of room inquiries for our properties in Coventry, but they want to live in, in Birmingham, so, uh, sorry, in Leamington, which is obviously very close geographically. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure we'll be doing a lot more expansion around this area as well. Okay, brilliant. Sounds like it's going to be a busy year. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm hoping some quite a large part of investor finance is going to land, allowing us to do a lot more uh, by refurb refinance work as well, instead of just just running the HMOs. Now, sorry, uh, the rent to rents, uh, rent to rent as a strategy is awesome for cash flow. Um, you know, you can build a very, very substantial cash flow very, very quickly. Um, but obviously, you don't own anything. So I'd like to have a parallel strategy of, of buying, refurbing and refinancing at the same time as building this rent to rent model. Brill. And apart from building the portfolio, is there anything else that you're up to in property that you'd like to share with HMO Nation? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I actually run a training business as well. So because of the because of the success we had in, in growing a, a, an HMO business and a service accommodation business, um, we have a, a training program that focuses on those two strategies. Um, teaching people how to acquire property and focusing really on people who are in a corporate job and coming from a similar background that, than I was in that have just realized that actually the corporate ladder isn't the way to create financial freedom for yourself. It just creates a very well-paid job. Um, so we like to work with people from that kind of background to show them how they can build a successful HMO or service accommodation business, uh, not necessarily using their own money. You know, we, we teach people how to work with investors uh, and create a scalable business that doesn't require their input on a day-to-day -day basis because I think that's a trap a lot of people who start in property fall into is that they actually just create another really well-paid job for themselves. So a lot of what people don't teach is the systems you need to put in place and how to actually create it as a business rather than just a very well-paid but still a job. Um, so yeah, we're training on that. If people want to check that out, then uh, you can see what that at propertyabundance.info. Um, where you can check out the the properties, oh, sorry, the programs that we have available. Great. We'll make sure we link up to uh, your all your contacts in the uh, show notes page, Chris. Awesome, Chris, thanks. what advice would you give to any current HMO investors? Um, I think it's going to be around processes, and it's around um, probably around sales processes most of all, because 
an HMO portfolio is only as profitable as its occupancy level. And I've met a lot of HMO investors recently who have struggled with occupancy. And it may not even be like a massive thing, but one room empty can be an extra 500 quid a month difference. So having strategies in place and having multiple sources of leads for your properties, I think is really, really important. And one of the biggest differences we found was when we actually introduced a referral program into our tenancies, into our um, into our properties. So I'm sure all your HMO owners have the big notice board by the front door. So we have a referral flyer on there or a referral poster um, because, you know, if we've got 145 tenants, that's that's potentially 145 commission only salespeople that can help us fill our, our other rooms. So whenever we get a new property now, a message goes out to all the tenants. Hey, have you got friends moving to the area? Have you got friends who want to move house? We've got a new property available. We've got rooms available. Um, there's the usual cash incentive available if you refer someone who then takes a six month tenancy. Uh, it's a great way to kind of inject a bit of pace into your room filling rate. And we've had properties filled before the, the, the refurb was even done just by having our, our existing tenants refer people. Um, so I guess a good good example of that is 39. You know, I mentioned we had 37, 35 and 39 all next to each other. So 39 was halfway through being refurbed and it was taken by a group of people and it, the, the whole property was full before we'd actually finished doing the refurb. So, again, you know, you're full from day one, which is ideal for creating return on investment. Absolutely. I mean, it, you, and you're absolutely right. There's a lot of HMO investors out there at the moment with some big voids in their portfolio. So really, really like that. Um, so it's quite a manual referral process you guys have got going on at the moment. Do you use any software or any added bolt-ons to your mm -hmm. to give your tenants, you know, additional value throughout the portfolio that enables you to engage with them a bit better and ask those kind of questions? Not, not so. We don't like have a tenant app or anything like that. But we we use Arthur Online um, mm -hmm. as our portfolio management software, um, and we can automate a lot of the text messaging through that. So uh, because it links in with um, Text Marketer UK, uh, which is a great kind of texting website for sending large scale texts out. Uh, Any time a property becomes available, we can just kind of quickly log on, type a message, and and send it to the whole the whole group, and then they have to refer it manually. But that referral process is very much manual at the moment. Yeah. So okay. once once somebody wants to refer, then that person calls up, say they've been referred by person in room whatever room six of forty five, um, the avenue or whichever whichever house it is. So we know who to thank. Uh, and then we go through our usual kind of tenant onboarding process. So credit checks, previous landlord reference, employment reference, um, all that side of things as we normally would for any new tenancy. Great. Chris, next question. How about any advice you'd give to people who are looking to get into HMO property for the very first time? My biggest advice would be to know the numbers because I see a lot of people falling into a trap of thinking something's a deal when it's not a deal. Um, and that can only really be overcome by knowing your area and knowing your numbers. So whenever we're running our mentorship programs or, or our training days, we have a whole section. We focus on getting to know your numbers. And for the first month of anybody on the mentorship, really, their, their work is not to go out and source properties. It is to get to know your area. It's to get to know your patch and get to know exactly what your room rates are. What can you get for a standard double? What can you get for a large double? What can you get for an ensuite? What can you get for a single? Getting to know that the, the individual different types of rooms and which areas perform well, which areas have high demand, um, which areas don't people want to live in. And that can only really come by being out in your area, kind of either walking around it, keeping it local to you so you've got some local knowledge about it um, and spending a lot of time focusing on that side of things rather than just kind of getting excited and going and finding any old property. Um, sure. Yeah. Great. Chris, before we sign off, we'd like you to recommend one great HMO resource. Then let HMO Nation know how they can connect with you and then we'll say goodbye. Okay. Um, great HMO resource. Um, do you mean in terms of like an online resource or in terms of what you can build into your business? Any, anything that's helped you build your HMO business. Okay. Um, I think the biggest one would be the connections with agents. And I think 
working with agents, particularly for rent to rent, is essential because they effectively become your sales team. Um, so I think if you can if you can develop relationships with multiple agents in your area, uh, and have them as part of almost an extended part of your power team, um, and make sure that they feel valued, you know, make sure you thank them when they bring you a deal, send them a big bunch of flowers, send them a box of chocolates, make them feel special. Um, I think you can do a lot of deals in quite a short space of time and possibly, you know, even off market stuff like, like this deal that we've just done in Bedford, um, only came because we had the direct contact with the agent. They were part of our team. We'd worked with them before and we spend a lot of time kind of getting to know them. Mm. So I think in terms of resources for HMOs, having, having agents on your team or extended team is, um, is a really good one to help supercharge the growth of your business. Okay. And how about if HMO Nation want to connect with you? How can they do that? Cool. So there's a few ways. Um, obviously, there's the website, propertyabundance.info. Uh, if you want to check out or speak to us about training, um, I have a Facebook page, which is at Chris Peel Property. And I have uh, same same for Instagram, at Chris Peel Property. Um, and then I'm also on LinkedIn. Just search for Chris Peel and look for the person with property in their title. <laughs> I think I think I'm the only Chris Peel in property at the moment. We'll we'll see. Great. We'll make sure we link up uh, all those profiles on your show notes page, Chris. Great. Chris, thanks for sharing your journey. We salute you. Let's get an HMO high five. High five. <laughs> an we'll absolute pleasure, mate. We'll see you soon, Chris. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thanks for joining us. If you've enjoyed this and want more informational, educational and inspirational HMO property content, then please hit the subscribe button and give us a like. See you next time.